Good evening. Thank you for joining us today. I am Dr. Marielle Jessup, Chief Science Officer for the American Heart Association. We are thrilled that you have joined us for the 2021 American Heart Association Research and Innovative Forum to celebrate the incredible advancements being made in cardiovascular and stroke research right here in the Philadelphia region. It is through the tireless efforts of researchers like those you will meet this evening that we have the science and technology to save countless lives and improve health outcomes. The impact of the COVID-19 pandemic has affected every one of us in every possible way. Most recently, we've started to see a distant light at the end of the tunnel. Scientific advancement through research has brought us three safe and effective vaccines that will accelerate our ability to get back to the things and people we love the most and to find out what will be changed forever. Tonight, I'm so thrilled to tell you that we have the honor and privilege of hearing directly from Dr. Kathleen Carrico, whose many years of research contributed to how we utilize messenger RNA vaccines today. I like to think that there have been many silver linings of this pandemic. The AHA, which has been known for being a provider of evidence-based truth and cutting through the misinformation, had to stop fighting the pandemic of cardiovascular disease and stroke for a minute and face our other pandemic of COVID-19. We responded in a way that I have to say was truly remarkable. We made a commitment to rapid response grants even when our revenue was decreasing. We developed a COVID registry that has enrolled almost 45,000 patients that, that showed a diversity of enrollment that's better than any other registry in this country. We provided information for high-risk patients as they manage their conditions through the pandemic, including about the COVID vaccine. And we began a number of messages to the public, including our recent one, which is, doctor, it's been too long, to encourage people to start getting back their health on track. Philadelphia uh, has not obviously escaped the scourge of the pandemic. There have been a, a total of 144,000 uh, COVID-19 cases to date. And uh, on Friday, the Department of Public Health reported 547 patients with COVID-19 currently being treated in Philadelphia hospitals with a total of 53 still on ventilators. In Philadelphia, we lost 3,434 people to COVID to date, and 35% of them were long-term care facility res residents. On the positive side, we have 244,000 people that have received at least one dose of the vaccine and 471,000 people that are fully vaccinated. So the total doses administered in Philadelphia exceeds one and a quarter million. And the Philadelphia's largest vaccine distributors include the two FEMA sites at Center City in North Philadelphia, uh, North Philadelphia and the Black Doctors COVID-19 Consortium, who are focused on the hardest hit zip codes and the African-American community. Tonight, we come together to recognize the American Heart Association's newly funded researchers in South, Southeastern Pennsylvania. It is through investing into research such as theirs that we can save lives and better understand the cardiovascular implications of the coronavirus. While nearly 80% of all cardi events, cardiac events are preventable, heart disease and stroke claim the lives of one in three Americans year after year. The American Heart Association is needed even in the middle of an infectious disease pandemic. 
It's now my distinct honor to now turn this uh, uh, evening over to our honored guest this evening, Dr. Elliot Barnasian, who uh, I've been fortunate enough to know for many years, and uh, he will in turn uh, introduce Dr. Carrico. Dr. Carrico worked tireless tirelessly to discover a method of how to avoid RNA-mediated immune reaction when combating infectious diseases with the power of messenger RNA. Her transformative research, which we'll hear about tonight, was the key to our future. So thank you, Dr. Barnathan. Thank you so much, Dr. Jessup. <clears throat> I appreciate it. And uh, I'm thrilled to be here alongside my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Kate Carrico, so we can all learn more about her work and her career. We will feature a short Q&A section, uh, so please place any questions you might have for Dr. Carrico or myself in the chat box, and we'll do our best to get as many of them uh, answered as possible. So uh, let me just briefly, before I turn it over to Dr. Carrico, um, tell you a little bit about her. Dr. Carrico is currently the Senior Vice President at BioNTech RNA Pharmaceuticals, where she has been since 2013. She's also an adjunct professor at the Perelman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania, where she worked for 24 years and where I had the distinct privilege of working with her and learning from her for eight years from 1989 to 1997. Kate received her PhD in biochemistry from the University of Szeged, Hungary in 1982. She will tell you about herself and her journey uh, in a few minutes. Um, for, for four decades, Kate's research has been focused on RNA mediated mechanisms with the ultimate goal of developing in vitro transcribed mRNA for protein therapy. Now she has investigated RNA-mediated immune activation and co-discovered that nucleoside modifications can suppress immunogenicity of RNA, which has widened the therapeutic potential of mRNA. She's a co-inventor of uh, several mRNA-related patents for the application of non-immunogenic nucleoside-modified RNA, 10 of which have already been granted in the US. She co-founded a company called RNARX in 2006, and until 2013 served as its CEO. Most impressively, however, her patent, which was co-invented with Dr. Drew Weissman, also at the University of Pennsylvania, on nucleoside-modified uridines in mRNA, is currently used to create the two mRNA COVID-19 vaccines in use worldwide by BioNTech, Pfizer, and Moderna, uh, NIH. For her truly impressive body of work, she has received numerous awards, including this year alone, the Pioneer Award from the Precision Medicine World Conference, the Rosenstein Award for Distinguished Work in Medical Science from Brandeis University, the Seicheny Prize from the Hungarian government, the Wilhelm Exner Medal from the Austrian Trade Association, Research America's Outstanding Achievement Award, Building the Foundation Award, and Bill and Fogey Global Health Award from Emory University, just to name a few, as well as an honorary degree from her university at Seged. So Kate, uh, please now tell our audience a bit about yourself and your journey from Hungary to the US and uh, to Germany. Since we are honoring our young scientists who have won grant awards from the AHA, perhaps you can tell a bit about your scientific journey and then maybe add what you think has ultimately enabled you to become as successful as you clearly have become. We'll then save some time at the end for Q&A and answer some questions. So Kate, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Elliot. And uh, thank you so much for having me here. It, I am thrilled as always, to be together with you and uh, doing a project. And <clears throat> to, uh, I am actually in Hungary right now, where I started. And um, uh, some years ago, as I did my PhD here in Hungary, Szeged, and um, my first project was uh, to synthesize RNA and join an RNA team. And um, 
This RNA was not messenger RNA because 78, we couldn't make messenger RNA. It was a short uh, trimer, uh, two prime, five prime linked oligodendrate, which was uh, in use by interferon. And my first project was to make this uh, anti, we believe that it is very as an antiviral compound. And so, and uh, we know today, even there is not many antiviral compound exist. But uh, early on, I realized that uh, this uh, RNA is uh, very difficult to put into the cells. Even it was a short one because uh, the cell surface was negatively charged. And um, so we couldn't get more funding for our research. And I had to find another place to <laughs> do research. And I wanted challenges. And so, Finally, I had to go all the way to Philadelphia and started to work at Temple University. Professor uh, Suhadolnyi Laboratory was also interested in these small molecules and uh, we did a lot of uh, uh, study there. Professor Suhadolnyi was writing actually the textbook on modified nucleosides. So early on, I learned a lot of modification. Actually, my PhD thesis, I used the modified nucleosides to make uh, the, this oligodenylate. And um, I participated actually in, in 1987 and 86 in a trial at, with Hahnemann University where we treated HIV patients with double-stranded RNA to induce their interference. So whatever I did, whatever I did, it was always something about RNA. And um, so lack of funding and other reason, 1989, I ended up at University of Pennsylvania. Elliot hired me <laughs> in the research assistant professor position. And um, you have to know that uh, it was a re very revolutionary time. It was just happened that uh, prior to that, I was nine months in Bethesda and I learned there that there is a, a lipofectin is created and commercially available. So I thought that maybe this RNA delivery might be solved by this uh, um, method and and also that um, a lot of things happened in the second part of the 80s so uh, PCR was introduced 1989 was uh, uh, tech polymerase was the molecule of the year and so when we started to work together actually I might mention that we are just a couple of days apart we born in different part of the world so we were in the same young enthusiastic uh, uh, scientist and uh, and uh, you know Elliot interest was in uh, urokinase receptor and uh, at one point we decided to make a messenger RNA for urokinase receptor and um, I remember vividly when we purchased the first PCR machine. It was, you know, you have to re remember that this was the time there were, you know, no internet, no email, nothing. It was, we, <laughs> and the PCR was just introduced and the PCR machine we purchased. And the, with the delivery method, with the PCR machine, with the uh, different molecular technology, which became available, we could proceed to make RNA coding for let's say urokinase receptor. And, uh, you know, we had to have um, the RNA polymerase, which actually in 1984 was first time commercial available. So before 1984, nobody could make really uh, translatable RNA, messenger RNA. And um, so it seemed that like uh, everything came, came together in this point and, um, and uh, we uh, made RNA. And um, of course, um, not what, it was not an easy, easy and simple time because there were no, no uh, uh, blueprint to, to follow. And, uh, but it was uh, also somewhat, it was easier in many ways. I, I remember now that uh, when we needed a plasmid, we just uh, sent a letter, <laughs> my mail delivered to some colleagues who had uh, certain plasmids and, you know, arrived in a, envelope, <laughs> the plasmid, no MTA was signed, nothing. <laughs> and it was a lot of freedom there. And um, so we did a messenger RNA coding for urokinase receptor. And um, this is a highly uh, modified, post translationally modified uh, uh, molecule. So when we first uh, 
uh, could prove that it is functional and for the function needed all of this post transition modification glycosylation processing of the carboxyl and we immediately realized that uh, messenger RNA will be very important and um, for something we didn't know for what but um, maybe in ex vivo we were thinking about the blood vessel, maybe before bypass surgery, we can flush through an RNA because actually when we put through the RNA and it went through, you know, five minutes, 10 minutes later, we already could detect that the uh, protein coded by the RNA could be detectable. But of course the level was low. And uh, so that uh, we needed a lot of improvement to make. And um, so, uh, Telling you now that um, this was like 30 years ago or 25 years ago. And I was just talking today, my colleague at BioNTech, who is a cardiologist, and you know, we discussed uh, where the, the messenger RNA therapy is going in cardiology, and it is a phase two clinical trial, and uh, bypass surgery patients were already injected with nucleoside modified mRNA, actually, with um, uh, at least uh, 20 of them, and injecting messenger RNA coding for VEGFA to increase the blood flow. And um, so, and that 25 years <laughs> had to be happened, you know, with the first time we could see that the RNA delivered uh, code for a protein which function. And um, of course, uh, together with the uh, Elliot, we did a big uh, uh, advancement there, but we haven't used the, uh, in animals at that point, And we did not realize that this RNA was um, immunogenic. So, the first eight years what we spent together, we were working to, towards cardiology. And then I, the next um, uh, 16 years, I spent in stroke research and tried to use this mRNA for therapy. As um, working with Drew Weissman, you know, we realized this messenger RNA is immunogenic. Uh, it induced the inflammatory process. So uh, that was the conventional RNA, of course. And then, we come up with the solution, how to make the RNA non-immunogenic. And this, when it came very handy that I learned all of these modified nucleosides and we realized that tRNA is not immunogenic. And then we incorporated modified nucleosides into this RNA. When eventually we learned that uh, uridine is somehow nature selected to be the most um, immunogenic in the RNA. And when we modified, a uridine and incorporated pseudouridine to the RNA, we get plenty of protein and no immune activation. It is kind of a dream comes through, you know, that <laughs> after all of these things. And uh, so, because I always wanted to develop mRNA for therapeutic purposes, so it was, um, um, uh, I could proceed with the work. Although at the beginning, uh, Drew thought that um, this immune activation is uh, good for the vaccine because his goal was to develop a, a HIV vaccine. But uh, he learned also that uh, that kind of immunogenicity is not good. It was inflammatory. So uh, eventually he used the nucleoside modified RNA and he found this is an excellent uh, uh, vaccine. So with the team worked out the formulation and in 2017, first time, uh, pseudouridine modified mRNA uh, incorporated into the lipid nanoparticle were presented that it protected monkeys from Zika virus. And this uh, was also very important that it was very small amount, like 50 microgram was sufficient for the monkey to protect. Today, we know that the Pfizer vaccine contains 30 microgram something that we are using in mice also, and it is sufficient for human, 30 microgram. And uh, so the process was that in, uh, you know, in 2013, I left academia and uh, I was delighted to go to the uh, industry and uh, go to Germany, a small company, no website, no nothing. And we were in a campus and uh, with my Japanese colleague, tried to find our way, not knowing German. <laughs> and, um, but eventually, you know, we introduced the modified nucleoside uh, program to BioNTech and it was 2013 and um, we uh, at BioNTech 2018, we made a 
um, collaborative agreement with Pfizer developing a, a mRNA based vaccine against uh, influenza. And we processed and we were very close to start the human trial when you know the corona uh, virus pandemic came and uh, it was flipped over to the program and it's just changing the order of the nucleotides in the mRNA and then it could uh, proceed. And um, we already know that in January we learned the uh, sequence uh, information and uh, you know in uh, December colleagues uh, already started to get the uh, injection. So Kate, um, it, it's just an extraordinary story. And you know the way you tell the story, it seems like it was all easy and one step after the other, uh, but we know it, it had a lot of hurdles. And um, I, perhaps you know you can sort of give your perspective on you know for the we have a lot of young scientists listening mm -hmm. in, and you know from the perspective of you know how do you deal with an experiment that doesn't work right or that you know maybe the environment that you have isn't as hospitable or your grants didn't get funded. What was it that kept you going all that way? So actually the experiments always work. It was your expectation which were not right because you didn't do the experiment which you had the expectation. So I found, you know, in a, when I was in high school uh, from Shea who introduced the word stress and uh, how to avoid this unwanted stress was he said that focus on what you can do and don't uh, take your eyes off from this so that uh, don't worry and don't pay attention what matter your colleague is working less and advancing more or earning more money don't don't worry you know don't pay attention just focus on your research and uh, it is also very important that you have to have to enjoy so it has to be a happiness when you figure out something is uh, trying and maybe you know it's not working on that way you expected and and it is good actually that uh, in science, we work with analog. Is there a precedent for that? And for that process, actually, it's good to be old. You know, it's, I like that I am not a ballerina, so more knowledge and <laughs> getting older is, is good. And um, so uh, when, uh, when some, for example, this, your grant uh, get rejected and I get, you know, okay, I, I, I am here, I never get an R01. So some people get you know, proud that, okay, Cuddy never get an R01. So that's, that's something, but of course it is better to get an R01, but you know, when they criticize, don't think about that, oh, they didn't understand, they are not knowing, but focus on that, that they are right and uh, try to fix it, uh, try to make more experiment, try to make it uh, express clearly, ask uh, colleagues to look at that. And um, so try to focus on, on what you can do because you cannot change the other person's opinion, but if you do um, what they are asking that uh, you have uh, uh, hope for that. And um, I, I, I work a, a lot of hours, you know, I remember purifying the RNA was like a four years process because, you know, I didn't even mention that we focused on that, but I remember uh, New Year's Eve, I was at work and New Year's Day, I was, and I was so happy. I remember that I could park my car right in the <laughs> door <laughs> because nobody was there. And I was so happy I'm coming and, and because a new idea came. And <laughs> so um, from outside, it seems like, you know, a lot of sweat and, you know, uh, miserable. I, I was happy. I was happy in the lab. Uh, and uh, doing a uh, different kind of uh, experiment. Interestingly, even in, from Hungary, every time it was there that uh, this would be good for somebody, something. And it was in my mind always that, and even when I went Germany and you know I commuted from the US, I, it was in my mind that I would stay there until the first person will be injected and this, at least one person will benefit from what I was doing for that many years. And, uh, so that was, I was spending there now eight years. <laughs> and um, so uh, I don't know what uh, people get uh, motivated, but um, to the success, what you, you know, what you are measuring success. For me, it was, um, you know, that uh, I could uh, keep my enthusiasm, even if something like seemed to other person a failure, but uh, I could uh, gather myself and come with the new ideas and, and, um, other thing is also that uh, the 
not let myself to define by other people. So if they say, you know, whether I am dumb or no, I am a star, it, it won't define me. I, I know who I am. And I am also the most proud of uh, in, in my career is that I could stay the same honest person I was in day one. So I did not compromise by things. And, and you know, even when I was demoted at uh, Penn, I kind of, try to see is as, as now I get the freedom. I don't have to worry about to get in some kind of a committee or something. I, I can do whatever I want. So everything has some advantage. And, and if um, I was terminated several times um, in my <laughs> career, I, I have to take it that I have a new opportunity. Now I get a new opportunity. <laughs> That's awesome. I know um, there's, there's two things about Kate. One, um, when she designs an experiment, it's probably the thing I learned is the most important is to focus on the control group because the better your controls, the better you can interpret your experiment. The other thing is Kate is an incredibly voracious reader. Every day she would come to the lab and have the latest issue of science asking me if I had read it yet because somebody was working on something in a completely different field, but she would take that information and bring it and, and use that. And I think those are two very important lessons uh, to be able to realize that science is built on the backs of people who have done things before. And that's perfectly fine. That's how you get ahead and, and be humble and be modest. And, and Kate is probably one of the most humble uh, people I've ever met, uh, but uh, you're finally getting your due. <laughs> I have to say also, it is very important to, to follow, Elliot, that uh, what your colleagues are doing, even when I was a, a graduate student, and, and uh, I, I am even today in contact with uh, those, because I need help. I need uh, uh, organic chemist help, and I don't know, and I, I know that what he's doing, and so I ask for help. And uh, this network, you know, what you can build, is also very important to rely on their uh, knowledge. Right. Uh, before we get to the q and A, I I just wanted you perhaps to give your vision because uh, all along you really were interested in uh, mRNA as a therapeutic. Mm -hmm. And what are some of the things, where's the field headed? Um, you know, what's next either in terms of vaccines, but also perhaps in terms of therapeutics. You already gave us a hint in terms of cardiovascular disease. There are many people here that are thinking about that. I'm sure everybody's gonna run home and start thinking about how to use mRNA for their next experiment, which is good. That's the whole point. So uh, actually the, uh, in the heart, they are injecting naked RNA and uh, uh, the VEGF RNA also used for a necrotic uh, wound for a diabetic patient. That was the phase one trial where one also went on. Um, the part, what uh, trial I uh, initiated was um, with, together with Sanofi, we are injecting messenger RNA coding for cytokines into the uh, tumor close to the surface. So it is head and neck or uh, melanoma. And uh, these uh, cytokines uh, will invite the immune cells to recognize, you know, we, we asked the tumor to make that actually. So we the tumor is working for us because uh, secreting uh, cytokines, which will invite the immune cells. And in animal model, we could see that those uh, circulating immune cells now that they can clear metastasis from the lung. And uh, now data is coming out also from patient that um, not only the injected, but the remotely located tumor can be shrink is shrink shrinking. And um, Another field where uh, messenger RNA is used is uh, passive immunization. So messenger RNA coding for antibodies. So uh, the technology is so advanced that um, uh, if there is a survivor of any kind of viral infection uh, from their blood, the cell can be identified, which can produce uh, antibody, which is uh, functional to fight this uh, uh, virus. And then this can be uh, generated as mRNA. And after injection, the next day, somebody will be fully protected. This is passive immunization. Of course, it had to be repeated injected. And uh, of course, these all of them is focusing on messenger RNA, which is secreted protein. In that case, you know, you can reach any kind of cells. For example, for anemia, which we have performed the experiment, we just inject uh, the 
EPO, erythropoietin encoding mRNA anywhere in the muscle, sub Q, IV, and uh, we can see the hematocrit increase uh, for a couple of days later. And other advantages, mRNA, when we would uh, have to target certain cells where intracellular protein is needed. Of course, you know, all of the product, like more than 100 product protein product is on the market. So it can be replaced. All of the antibodies, which is right now as a protein, can be replaced because our body can make the drug. We just have to deliver the mRNA and uh, there will be no purification. So Kate, um, one of the things that was uh, probably the biggest breakthrough, and there's a question about that uh, in the Q&A, was your discovery that uridine was highly immunogenic. Now, I know that it was a control that gave you that answer, but I wonder if you could perhaps describe the experiment and how you discovered that it was uh, uh, something like pseudouridine that, uh, that was the key that unlocked the mystery. Yeah, so actually you mentioned the control. When we work together, you remember that we get this uh, Penton protein and, and turn out that actually the buffer was <laughs> increased the uh, trans, uh, translation of the RNA for, uh, you know, 10,000 times or whatnot. <laughs> so, and um, an experiment, you know, we try to, I try to figure out, you know, I to work in 10 years and. And then uh, all of a sudden, I realized that all of this work is cannot be used for therapy because it is immunogenic. And um, I tried to change many things on the RNA, put a different cap, put longer poly tail, and so on. And uh, you know, looking around in the freezer, I put all kind of RNA which I have there. And actually, the tRNA which I had there at the beginning, I used for uh, RNA precipitation as a, as a carrier. So I put also on uh, uh, these dendritic cells, immune cells, I put uh, 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 transfer RNA. And that was when we discovered that the transfer RNA is not activating anything. It is like silent. Of course, it was a you know, shorter RNA, but actually I had an even shorter RNA and it did activate it. And so what is so unique about the transfer RNA that 25% is modified nucleosides. So immediately I had to run to the book and try to see that what we should know about modified nucleosides and turn out that it was like more than 100 different uh, modification exist. And, um, and actually in the 70s when they discovered CAP was the heydays. And then it was like uh, then less and less publication because uh, when they uh, did nothing incorporated, there were no difference. And so there was, how we could put, our RNA is always made from the four basic nucleotides so that post-transcriptionally enzymes are changing. So I call up again a classmate and I ask him because he discovered the enzyme, Tom Ashkish, and he discovered pseudouridine actually, how to uh, incorporate it in our uh, ribosomal RNA. And he said, oh, this is too complicated to you. There is no solution. And I call up the other colleague. He said, oh, maybe you make the RNA with pseudouridine, incorporate with triphosphate. And that's what I did. Uh, he even told me that where to order and then incorporate it the pseudouridine, but not just pseudouridine. We purchased 10 different nucleotides. We didn't know which one is good. And some of them did not incorporate it. Some of them incorporated, but we didn't get any protein from it. And finally, we were down that, uh, you know, some incorporated. And when we put on the cells, it turned out when we modified the uridine, then, then we did not get any immune response. So. At that point, actually, in 2004, we are there. Uh, it was published in Science that poly U is polyuridine is activating TOL7. It was just published, so we were a little bit scooped, but they didn't know that you can modify it. <laughs> That's great. Um, I know uh, we're getting close to our, our time, so um, are there any other questions uh, before we move on to the next step? I am not hearing any nor seeing any. I think that is, yeah, that's the only questions we have for today. Okay. Well, I want to thank you uh, so much. It's been a pleasure. Uh, time flies very quickly, but um, it's uh, your work has clearly made an amazing, uh, 
ability to go from a sequence of a virus to a vaccine in less than a year. And that's just absolutely astounding. And to a large extent, we have you and 40 years of really hard work to thank for that. So thank uh, you. The, Elio, the last part, of course, our colleagues and many, many scientists, I would emphasize, and companies, BioNTech, Pfizer, Moderna, all worked on it very hard. Absolutely. All right. Um, so uh, as Dr. Jessup mentioned earlier, we're here to recognize the incredible advancements being made here in southeastern Pennsylvania. And I congratulate all the newly funded researchers on their transformative work in combating America's number one killer cardiovascular disease. I'd li like to now welcome Bradley Davidson and Wal Walter Koch, who will share their work and the impact it could have on the future of medicine. I'm very excited for this opportunity to talk to you about the research in my lab at Swarthmore College investigating heart formation in this simple chordate, the Siona embryo. My research in Siona was inspired by a talk I saw from Mark Fishman, who uses another simple animal model, zebrafish, to generate really important and clinically relevant discoveries regarding human heart formation and congenital disorders. This led me to start working on an even more simple representative of uh, or, or relative of the vertebrates and humans, uh, the tunicates. As shown in this tree here, the tunicates are part of our own chordate phylum and are the closest sister group to the vertebrates, which include simple organisms like zebrafish as well as humans. The tunicates, however, diverged from the ancestor to the vertebrates prior to two whole rounds of whole genome duplications in the vertebrate lineage, making vertebrate genetics much more complex than the genetics in these simple relatives. Additionally, Tugan embryos have extremely low cell numbers, and this cellular simplicity permits high resolution analysis of heart cell behavior. As shown in these micrographs here, there's only four cells shown in red here that contribute to the heart in these embryos. Additionally, as I mentioned before, tunicates and the Siona embryos have genetic simplicity, which permits high resolution analysis of the cardiac genetic program. Cardiac genes interact through these networks, turning each other on and off to establish heart cell identity. In vertebrates, the presence of multiple copies for each of these genes make these already complex networks very dense and interconnected. In Siona, the presence of single copies of these heart genes allows us to unravel some of the, the kind of fundamental wiring of these heart genes, how they turn each other on and off, and thereby establish the identity of heart cells. The AHA is graciously funding some of my research, in particular questions about how signals first establish heart cell identity. As shown here in Siona embryos, the future heart cells receive a signal represented here in red dots that's secreted by neighboring cells. Some of the heart cells respond to the signal to form heart. Other cells that have the potential to form heart don't respond to these signals. And these kind of subtle differences in the way cells respond to signals are really critical in understanding the formation of tissues and organs in humans and other organisms, in particular, heart tissue and heart organs. The fundamental insights that we can gain by looking at this simple organism will help unravel the complex role of signaling in human heart formation and in the development of congenital heart defects. Uh, my name is Wally Koch. I'm at the Lewis Katz School of Medicine here in Philadelphia at Temple University. Uh, I'm a basic and translational scientist studying novel mechanisms of heart failure in hopes of finding some new therapies. Um, I wanted to talk to you today about 
uh, my inspirations in the past to get me involved in this type of research. And I've been very fortunate to have some very positive role models and mentors in my career, starting with my PhD at the University of Cincinnati uh, with Dr. Arnold Schwartz, who got me interested in heart failure um, and cardiac biology. Um, after leaving Arnie's lab, I went to Duke University Medical Center and the Howard Hughes Medical Institute to do a postdoctoral fellowship with Bob Lefkowitz, um, who is a, a pioneer in G-protein coupled receptors, such as the beta adrenergic receptors. Bob, of course, won the Nobel Prize in chemistry in 2012. But in his lab, I got uh, interested in the enzymes that regulate the beta adrenergic receptors called the GRKs. And from doing basic biology and my background in heart failure, I put the two together. And for the last 25 years, I've been studying the role of these enzymes in the heart, uh, and they appear to be pathologic. So our translational aspects of the work are trying to find inhibitors of two of these kinases, GRK2 and GRK5 as uh, all our animal model and preclinical work appears that inhibiting these enzymes leads to a novel way of improving cardiac function. Um, we, with a collaborator, uh, we are getting close to having a lead small molecule that we hope we can uh, test in humans in, in the coming years. And so, um, part of this work is funded by the American Heart Association. I was fortunate to be a 2018 Merit Awardee, uh, which is an unrestricted grant um, to support my work. And so I'm indebted to the American Heart Association um, for their support. Um, and I hope you enjoy the evening. Thanks. Well, uh, thank you, Bradley, and thank you, Walter. And it was really terrific learning more about your work um, and you uh, personally. Uh, it's terrific that the AHA uh, is able to collaborate in your progress. And I wanna take a personal moment to thank Kate for being here and for all of her contributions uh, to the mRNA field. It obviously has changed the world in meaningful ways. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is... Uh, William Gray. I'm, a, I'm the physician uh, president of the AHA's Southeastern PA Board of Directors and the system chief of the Division of Cardiology at uh, Mainline Health and the president, uh, co-director of Lankanaw Heart Institute. Uh, before I get started in our um, final comments, I do want to make sure to thank and recognize the American Heart Association sponsors for making today's conversations possible, Cozen O'Connor, Infor, and FMC Corporation. Thank you for your dedication to the mission of the American Heart Association. We are eternally grateful. <clears throat> the American Heart Association has fought the pandemic since its early stages because we're dedicated to helping people live longer and healthier lives. The virus can cause serious heart complications and strokes in otherwise healthy people. And individuals with heart disease and heart disease risk factors like high blood pressure and diabetes are at increased risk for severe complications from the COVID-19 virus. Recent scientific studies have found that obesity, high blood pressure, diabetes, heart failure were the four top risks for COVID-19 complications. Working with your doctor is the best way to modify or manage these conditions by lifestyle changes or medications. And some could argue that one of the most in, um, impactful uh, things that an individual could do is to, to drop weight um, to uh, fight off the issues around obesity and COVID. If you're living with one or more of these conditions, it's important to talk to your doctor about how a COVID-19 vaccine can help prevent you from getting the virus. Your doctor can answer your questions about the vaccine and how it can protect your health. A COVID-19 vaccination will protect you, your family, and your community. To eliminate the virus and to get back to normal, the American Heart Association encourages everyone to get vaccinated as soon as they are eligible. As we close out our 2021 Research and Innovation Forum, I wanna thank you for joining us. I also wanna thank Dr. Mariel Jessup, Dr. Elliot Barnatham and Dr. Caitlin Carico for all, uh, and all of our newly funded researchers. We are incredibly grateful to our sponsors and supporters as mentioned before. Finally, 
we would we would now like to take a moment to recognize all of our newly funded researchers of the southeastern Pennsylvania region. We're incredibly thankful for your hard work and your dedication, and we appreciate you joining us tonight. Stay tuned for our closing video.